Two years ago, Twitter suffered from a well-publicized compromise in which an attacker forced prominent Twitter accounts, including Elon Musk and then-candidate Joe Biden, to tweet out links to cryptocurrency scams. As a part of their response to the security incident, Twitter hired Peter Zatko, also known as Mudge, to run and improve their security department. Less than 18 months later, Mudge was fired, and he subsequently filed a whistleblower complaint with the U.S. government. Last week, Mudge testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. That hearing was about three hours long, but don't worry, I watched it so you don't have to. My name is Eldridge, I've been working in the IT and security industry for over 10 years, and I want to go through and hit the high points of what happened during those three hours, the things that I think are most interesting and the most important, and provide some color and context from my experience where I can. So with that said, let's dive in. At the beginning, Mudge uh, read from his prepared statements uh, that summarized the overarching concerns that he had about Twitter's security and privacy practices. And he hit on two points that he kept coming back to in responses to the senator's questions. The first was that Twitter doesn't know what data they have or where it's stored, according to Mudge. This presents a problem as you might expect. If you don't know where the data is, you can't perform operations on it when you need to, up to and including deleting data that you don't want to have. The second concern that Mudge raised was that according to him, Twitter employees have way more access than they need, and more employees at Twitter have that access than they should. This is in defiance of an information security principle known as the principle of least privilege. If you've studied information security or work in IT, you've probably run into this before. The basic definition is uh, you should have access to the data you need to do your job and absolutely no more access. Now, security is a gradient. It's hard to get to something perfectly, but you try to get as close to these good security principles as you can. So. That's a, that's a concern if that's something that's truly happening inside Twitter. Uh, so those are the two concerns that Mudge raised with his prepared statements, uh, and then they went into Q&A with the senators. So throughout that Q&A, they asked uh, a lot of extremely varied questions, but I want to go through some of Mudge's biggest concerns and some of his biggest uh, thoughts around Twitter security in response to those questions. So one of the things that he said over and over was that Twitter is about 10 years behind other major tech companies in terms of their information security program and practices. Now, he didn't provide a lot of context uh, or justification for saying that, but he was presenting to a room full of senators, not a room full of engineers. So that's somewhat understandable. So I just wanted to look at some other prominent attacks that came to mind and see kind of how that fits into Mudge's uh, analysis of Twitter. So the Twitter attack that I'm thinking of is the one that I mentioned to start the video, which is two years ago, Twitter was compromised by some people wanting to tweet out Bitcoin scams. Uh, so that was two years ago. Now, eight years ago, in 2014, Apple's iCloud services, certain accounts there were compromised, and a lot of private photos from celebrities were released to the public. 17 years ago, at Google, uh, China compromised some Google systems back in 2005. So a prominent Apple attack eight years ago, a prominent Google attack 17 years ago. There are more at both those companies and others, but those are two of the most prominent that came to mind. Between eight and 17 years, I, I think it makes sense to say Twitter being 10 years behind the mark. Uh, I, I can certainly see how much would come to that conclusion, uh, at least from the outside. But it's also important to look at other major tech companies that are doing maybe not as well as Apple and Google are. Uh, so one to look at is the Uber compromise. This happened last week. It was a major compromise and it's one that they're still dealing with. And if you wanna know more about that, I'll be putting out a video about that soon. But it's worth noting that even when major tech companies that are well regarded for their security practices and have not had major compromises in years uh, exist, there are other tech companies that are not doing quite as well. And I also wanna point out that when people talk about major tech companies, they do tend to group Twitter in with its, uh, with its competitors. So that would include Facebook, of course, for social media. Uh, YouTube is not quite in the same vein as Twitter, but people do tend to compare and contrast given that they're both social, TikTok. And one thing that's worth noting is all of these companies, except for Twitter, are extremely valuable. Now, Twitter is valued highly on the stock market, but 
it's been underperforming even the New York Times over the last uh, five to 10 years, I think. And so compare that against, say, Google and Apple, some of the most, uh, the most highly valued companies in the history of the world. So yes, Twitter may be behind. I don't think it's that uh, surprising that that might be the case, but it's also worth remembering that when we're comparing and contrasting them with other companies, those other companies tend to have a one to $2 trillion market cap. And that's just not the type of money and resources that Twitter can throw around. So I do think it makes sense, but that's some context for, for why that might be the case. Another area that Mudge kept coming back to was the access given to Twitter employees and specifically engineers. Mudge said that about half of Twitter's employees, that is 4,000 people, are engineers. And engineers have access to way more system resources and way more accounts and data than they reasonably should, breaking the principle of least privilege. In particular, Mudge called out that uh, Twitter engineers could read direct messages between people. They could also tweet as other users and accounts. In particular, Mudge called out that a Twitter engineer would theoretically be able to tweet as a US senator, with no one realistically being able to point out that it came from an engineer. He then dove into Twitter's detective controls, or lack thereof. Now, if you've dived into security systems uh, around an organization or a company, you'll have noticed a lot of preventative controls. These are things like firewalls and antivirus. They attempt to prevent the thing that's bad from happening. At large organizations or even small ones that have uh, comprehensive security programs, you're also going to have detective and response controls, detecting when something's bad and attempting to remediate it and get back to a known good state. The analogy I like to use here is it's similar to credit card fraud protection. If you are in a place you aren't normally, you might swipe your credit card and it might not go through. And then you get a call or email from your bank that says, hey, are you actually in this location that's different from normal? And are you trying to buy this? And the charge doesn't go through until you confirm. This is a preventative control, similar to a firewall blocking a connection. It prevents the bad thing from happening in the first place. Detective in response is when you get your credit card bill and you see that there's a few charges on there you don't recognize, and you realize that your card may have gotten skimmed at a particular place. Then you call your bank and you say, hey, these charges, I didn't make them. The bank launches an investigation using access to all of the data that they have, goes back, reverses the charges, and gets your account back to a good state while also reissuing your credit card with new numbers. That is a detective and response control. You detected it by checking your bill and the bank responded by removing the charges and issuing you a new card once they'd confirmed that. So in this particular example, Twitter does not have that fraud response and doesn't have an ability to detect uh, those changes. So that's, uh, you know, it's not mind blowing that a company might not have the best logging and detective response situation uh, in place but it is pretty damning for a company the size and age of Twitter dealing with that much information around that many people to not have a good way to prevent people at Twitter from tweeting as senators or presumably heads of state. So that was a huge concern that Mudge came back to a few times. The other thing he mentioned was the 2011 consent decree that Twitter has with the FTC. Now, if you're not familiar with these, sometimes when the FTC comes after a company for violating a particular regulation or potentially violating a particular regulation, what they will do, rather than taking a lawsuit all the way to its natural conclusion, they will work with the company, particularly if it's a newer company or newer technology, to try and come to a settlement where both sides agree what types of precautions and security and other things that the company might need to do. So back in 2011, the FTC came after Twitter because Twitter had asked for people's phone numbers to use to send out second factor authentication codes via text. You know, those six digit codes you get sometimes via text and you have to type it in in addition to your password. Now as a security control, Twitter was supposed to use those phone numbers for two factor and nothing else. However, they did use it to support some of their advertising and other data collection systems. The FTC investigated, and the FTC and Twitter came to an agreement in 2011. That included uh, meeting certain security and privacy standards going forward and being subject to audit. What Mudge called out was that the audit that Twitter was being subjected to 
was in fact not particularly rigorous, according to him, and that the audit was conducted by people and organizations that Twitter had paid. So I have not had experience with doing an audit for an FTC uh, or similar settlement agreement, but I have worked with other types of audits for pretty standard compliance agreements. Uh, if you work at a company and you're attempting to sell a product, other large companies buying it may want to know what types of security you have. So it's not uncommon to undergo an audit for a standard uh, security compliance certificate and present information and proof that you were doing certain security things and then you can present that third-party audit of your security to a potential customer or existing one. Now there's different incentives here. Of course if you're a company that's trying to show that you are secure and going out of your way to purchase an external audit to come in and make sure you're doing the right secure things, uh, that generally tends to be a pretty beneficial arrangement for both parties. This sounds like it may not have been as such, but it sounds like the auditing processes were similar. And Mudge brought up some concerns about Twitter's auditing process that did sound similar to some things that I've seen uh, in some of the audits I've been a part of. So just to give an example from, from kind of my experience, when you're working with the auditors, they tend to have a list of standards based on whatever framework they're working with. In this case, it would be their consent decree, uh, in cases I've worked at, they tend to have particular standards of, hey, your security should be applied this way in these arenas. So as an example, one thing might be all of your laptops at your company need to have antivirus software installed. And then when the audit happens, what they may do is look at your list of laptops, ask for evidence from 10 laptops out of maybe 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, and show a screenshot of antivirus running on that machine. Now, they did just ask for 10 at random, so there may be you get lucky, and even if you don't have a lot of antivirus running, uh, you get lucky and the 10 that they asked for already have it. But these are human interactions, and it's possible and expected to negotiate with your auditor about what types of proof you need to provide to meet the line item that they're attempting to audit. Now, whether you meet it or not is of course up to the auditor, but when you're negotiating, uh, you have a decent amount of flexibility of not only what is the original source of truth that they're willing to accept, but what are they willing to accept to prove that you have antivirus in the first place. So there's a lot of negotiation going on, and if the auditor is an external auditor that you're paying, working with you to turn over a report to the FTC, I can certainly see how Twitter could kind of juice the game in their favor. And in fact, I'll talk about a little bit later some of Mudge's other concerns around antivirus, or rather the security updates, not being applied consistently across the organization. One thing that Mudge brought up that was a little odd to me was Mudge said that Twitter did not have a test or dev environment. Now, if you're not familiar with large cloud scale environments, what you typically have is you have a production environment. Every company that is selling or giving a service has this. This is the software that actually runs on servers that communicates with end users and customers. A test dev environment tends to be a copy of that environment where you can make changes to the code and see if anything breaks before you push it over to prod and let it have access to customers. This is not particularly uncommon, especially in smaller companies. It's a lovely thing to have. But as you grow to this giant planet scale app that Twitter is, you tend to not focus on development and testing in quite the same way. What we did when I was at Google was we would have, uh, first off, you would have multiple people needing to approve code before it was committed to Google's infrastructure. And then rather than deploying it in a planet scale test environment, it was deployed in a, to a very, very small subset of users. So maybe half a percent of users of whatever product would see the new thing, whatever it was. And then if that went well, then 1%, then 5%, then 10, 50, and 100%. So maybe Mudge was just kind of hand-waving that explanation away, given that he wasn't presenting to senators. Uh, maybe that's what he meant when he said dev test environment rather than an actual clone of the production environment where you're doing separate work in. Uh, I did think that was a little odd for someone who's been in the industry that long. And again, maybe we just had wildly different experiences. 
So I'm not sure if that was a hand wave for the senators or whether he was just actually maybe a little out of sync with what more modern companies are doing, or maybe he was expecting that since he said their infrastructure was 10 years behind. Not really sure what was going on there. That was uh, a little odd, to be honest. Another thing that some senators were asking Mudge about was foreign agents placed in the company, as well as implications for national security. Uh, you may or may not know that the intelligence agencies in the United States monitor the internet pretty broadly, and when they see attacks or compromises or potential attacks or compromises against major American companies that might have implications for national security, they do reach out and notify those companies. And one that the senators were asking about was that Twitter was in fact notified that foreign agents were being placed inside Twitter. Now, what exactly an agent is and what they're doing can vary, and the senators didn't give a whole lot of detail about what that was, but one thing they did say, uh, and that Mudge didn't challenge at all, was that there were multiple agents from China and India placed inside Twitter. And one of the things that was particularly concerning is when Mudge brought this up to senior leadership and executives, according to him, the response boiled down to, well, if we already have some foreign agents, we might as well employ more and keep growing. As you can imagine, this is pretty concerning. Uh, foreign agents, if they were able to join Twitter as engineers, would have all of the access I mentioned earlier, able to see private tweets, uh, private DMs, look at private accounts, as well as tweet on behalf of other people, or just collect some of the information that Twitter collects on all of its users, whether it's you, me, or a head of state, and then exfiltrate that data somewhere else. So lots of concerns, uh, neither the senators nor Mudge alluded to any of that having happened. Uh, but they were obviously concerned about the national security implications for the U.S. In addition to the questions about the security and privacy concerns, as well as solutions, Mudge was asked about content moderation. He tended to hand wave this away, understandably so, as at Twitter, content moderation fell under the legal team, not under the information security team. This is pretty typical. Content moderation tends to be a very human question, for instance, this tweet, does it break our rules? That's somewhat of an opinion. Uh, if it does break our rules, opinionated or not, what do we do? Do we delete this tweet? Do we flag it? Do we take this account down for a week? Do we delete this account permanently and prevent this user from ever signing up again? Do we use different standards for different people? These are all complicated, personal, opinionated, and often legal questions. So not something that information security engineers are necessarily well equipped to solve. However, security often does work with the content moderation people to solve for broad classes of questions and concerns. For example, this is not the case in Twitter, but if a company was operating primarily in a few countries, and then they were also getting requests from other countries here and there, they might decide that their information security team should look into something if they're typically getting three or four requests from a country one day, and then one day it spikes up to 10 or 100,000 requests. So you can think of heuristics and metrics like that, whereas security could come in and kind of prevent content from suspicious sources from being submitted in the first place. But once it's on the platform, typically content moderation teams is a much separate discipline from information security. So not too surprising that Mudge kind of hand waved on those. And so I won't spend a whole lot of time diving into the questions or answers there. So those were the topics that I found the most interesting and relevant during the hearing. Now, before, during, and after the hearing, there's been a lot of chatter on news articles and blogs, as well as tweets from professionals, about both the quality of Twitter's security and the quality of Mudge as an executive. And there are a lot of concerns around Twitter security and privacy that Mudge talked on, but there were also a lot of people saying that working under Mudge as an executive was problematic. Now, I'm going to share just kind of from my experience. I haven't worked at Twitter. I haven't worked with or for Mudge, but just kind of sharing from my experience in other companies and kind of how the office politics breaks down at that level or tends to. And one is that when people are concerned about a weak executive, it's because they're not able to deliver on their vision. So Mudge was a chief information security officer that is a CISO, and he was doing things like, as I mentioned earlier, 
trying to get information about which systems didn't have security updates, and it took him a month to get that data. In the hearing itself, he did talk a bit like someone who was asking for permission and trying to get other people at the company to help him out, which was a bit of a strange tack for an executive to take, uh, in my experience. If it's taking you a month to get your security updates, the information on them, then that's something that an executive needs to go and drive forward that change or drive forward getting that information in the first place. So it did seem a bit odd that a lot of Mudge's concerns were about him not being able to do the job that he was specifically put there to do. Now, was that because he was ineffective? I'm not sure. It might also have been that during his tenure there, the CEO was Jack Dorsey. And Jack has most of his wealth at his other company, Square, where he was also CEO. So even if Jack was very focused on security, and according to Mudge, he wasn't, but even if he was, he would not have been able to push forward that vision and that direction as a part-time CEO with the majority of his focus elsewhere. With Jack somewhat absent, it probably came down to a lot of horse trading and fighting between the lieutenants of the other C-level executives. And it seems like Mudge just wasn't particularly good at that, whether or not he had Jack's support. So it seemed like Mudge was probably a weak executive according to the people that were there at the time. But I think it's pretty obvious and it seems correct, at least in my opinion, as someone external, that Twitter's security and privacy practices are bad and Mudge was a bit of a weak executive. Whether or not it was because he didn't have the support or whether that's just his, him as an executive or a combination of both, I'm not sure. But I think it's pretty easy for both Twitter's security practices to be weak and Mudge to be a weak executive to be both true at the same time. And one thing to remember is, as weak or not as Mudge may have been, he was brought in response to Twitter suffering a major catastrophic breach in which people tweeted out cryptocurrency scams as a presidential candidate in the US. So Twitter was already in not the best space from the beginning. So it is probably likely that Mudge is a bit of a weak uh, executive, but also extremely likely that Twitter's security could use some pretty significant improvements. So. That's kind of the tie a bow around some of the things you might have heard about Mudge as a weak executive, uh, as well as Twitter security itself. Now, one thing I, I wasn't going to talk on, but uh, I, I think I want to touch on just very briefly, is the Elon Musk Twitter purchase situation. And the reason is because there was a bit of news going around afterwards about how this would or would not impact Elon's purchase of Twitter. Now, I am not a lawyer, I don't have an MBA, so I don't know how much color and context I can provide there, but one thing I do want to touch on is the day that Mudge's hearing took place in Congress. At the end of the day, Twitter's stock went up a slight amount, while the broader markets went down about 2%. So, pretty strong showing for Twitter stock in that situation. And so, looking at it in isolation, a lot of people seem to think that this meant that the security concerns around Twitter weren't that bad, or at least weren't that bad as far as the market were concerned. And I think this is uh, a little bit premature for a few reasons, but maybe not wildly off the mark. So one thing uh, that you may or may not know is that when security incidents happen at companies, overwhelmingly, if the stock goes down, as it often does, the stock recovers within six to 12 months. That doesn't happen every time, but it does happen the overwhelming majority of times. And in terms of Twitter, this was not a security incident. This was a hearing about their practices in general. So this was not even a specific thing that happened, but a potential of things that might happen. But from what I can see, neither of those things were really ready to impact the price at all because of the current situation with Elon and Twitter and the ongoing lawsuit. Now, if you haven't been paying too much attention, just to do a quick 20 second recap, Elon made an offer for Twitter where he would buy Twitter outright at $54.20 a share, and he waived due diligence. Uh, he is now suing Twitter to get out of that deal in the Chancery Court in Delaware. Now, Delaware's Chancery Court is specifically made to adjudicate these types of disputes. And in particular, since Musk has waived due diligence, it seems that the only way 
that he can actually get out of this purchase that he seems to want to get out of at this point is to show that there was a material adverse effect because of Twitter lying to the SEC and shareholders. Twitter's disclosures to the SEC, like most companies, come with many, many caveats and asterisks, uh, preventing them from committing to very much. Um, whether or not you think that's okay, that's extremely standard practice, for better or for worse. And so what Elon would have to do at this point, it looks like, to get out of the deal, is show that Twitter knew something was wrong, they knew it would affect their stock price in such a way to significantly change it, and they either withheld that information or lied to the SEC and shareholders. And the market seems to think that that is an uphill battle. If Elon loses this case, what that means is every shareholder at Twitter has an IOU from the richest man on earth that they are owed $54.20 per share. So the stock staying at the level it's at while other stocks are deteriorating is I think less a reflection of Twitter's security practices and more a reflection of the fact that the market thinks that Elon is going to lose in the Chancery Court and have to pay a settlement or the 54.20 per share. Whether or not that is true, I'm not sure, but that does seem to be what the market is thinking and that's probably what's going on with Twitter's stock and the mudged hearing is probably relatively irrelevant. So that's probably what's happening there. So those are all the things that I found interesting and relevant from the Twitter mudge hearing. And so I'll be dropping a few more videos in the near future, explainers on the Uber compromise, as well as explainers on some of the new security technology people are recommending to secure your accounts and connections. So thanks for dropping by. I've been told that I'm legally obligated to end every YouTube video with the words like and subscribe, but I'm, you know, not gonna do that.